Welcome. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, customer experience has been something that I've been very interested in. It's one of those things where you know, somebody mentions something to you and it kind of, you start wondering, what's that all about? And that, that happened about six years ago. I started exploring you know, the domain of knowledge of customer experience management, which um, for those of you that, that you, you have these iconic companies that you deal with that have that marketing brand, that look and feel, uh, no matter how you interact with their company, uh, you get that, that sense or they are conveying their emotions around their technology. Does anybody have an example of a company with a really good customer experience? Come on. Yeah. Um, Chipotle. Chipotle? Disney? Disney? HDI. H yeah, HDI. <laughs> I was actually thinking about Apple. Right? Is there anything that you do with an Apple product or you go to the store? Everything is branded consistently. You get that very uh, simple, clean, fresh interface, everything about the product. That's an intentional design. It just doesn't happen. So exploring customer experience management was something where I wanted to understand the theory and practice around customer experience management. And then I wanted to say, OK, how does that apply to IT service management? And I started doing this about uh, five or six years ago. Um, one thing I just want to give you a heads up about, um, the keynote presentation that I've done on customer experience management is going to be re-recorded. And then I'm going to be putting it out on LinkedIn. Um, I'm doing this for the pre-conference that I taught on Tuesday around customer experience management. So if you're wanting to get people to understand more about the concepts of customer experience management, that'll be made available to you uh, probably ne in the next two weeks. So if you connect with me on LinkedIn, you know, you'll see it coming up in the post. So I want to make that available because I think this is a very powerful message about customer experience management. So this particular presentation came out of me beginning to see that with so much of what we're doing today being put into the cloud, that customer experience management is actually even more difficult than it was five, 10 years ago. So when we look at the trends of what's happening just with self-service today and looking at the way that customers are interacting with companies, right? They're using the FAQ, FAQs that are available on websites more so than calling on the phone. 76% uh, of the people said that they prefer to use the FAQs on the website over calling. Um, and it might have something to do with we don't really get a good response when we call. You know, there can be a lot of things that influence that, but that's a significant change. It used to be the first thing people wanted to do was call. Now they're starting to reach out to those social networking and the websites and the portals that we create as their preferred method of interacting. <laughs> They also prefer other methods of self-service that weren't available years ago. Those are becoming preferred, usage is up. Um, and, it can, and again, this isn't just with the, the new generation. This is all generations, and I think a lot of it has to do with our phones. Think of how we customize the way that we use our phone, the different apps that we put on, on the phone, the way that we're connecting with things from a simple device, no matter where we are. And our end users are becoming much more familiar with the technology, and they're preferring to use that as a mechanism of interacting with, with uh, companies. And then online chat, I am not a big fan of this. How many of you like to use little chat windows that pop up on a, on a product site? You know what I don't like about them is they don't go at the speed of conversation. I can clearly see that this person is interacting with about 15 people at the same time, and I keep going, hello, are you there? Can you? And I end up terminating it before I get an answer because I'm thinking it's going to be fast and it's not. Um, but you guys are not alone. Up 58%. That's a significant amount of you know interacting on chat instead of picking up the phone. So what we see is that the customers are embracing these alternative ch channels now more so than they ever have in the past. We need to be able to gain insights from what they're using on their phones, how they're interacting with us through the customer cloud to better understand how to serve those customers. And that's a, a challenge. Think about how difficult it is to understand the knowledge across the customer's cloud to our cloud and get that analytical view of what, how to serve our customers and how to improve that service. 
The predictive analytics, though, will give us the, the, the ability to understand what channel is the best channel or is the preferred channel, a way to interact with our customers. So we have to figure out a way to do that, to, to create the analytical view across those different channels. So if we start, we look at there's a ton of different kinds of clouds, right? We, keep the, we throw these words around like crazy out there in the industry. So we see that there's a private cloud. That would be an individual connecting to their own cloud. It's not accessible by anyone else. We have the community cloud, which is generally around a community of people that have shared interests. We have the public cloud, which is available, obviously, to the public. And then hybrid, some form of collection of those different clouds. About four years ago, I put my entire company up in the cloud. I now manage it solely by my phone. I own no infrastructure, and my life changed, right? Not having to worry about servers being up or, you know, everything is just so much easier to manage. That was a low, po a low cost of entry for me. It allowed me to provide services in better ways than I could in the past if I had owned that infrastructure. So I have a hybrid cloud. I have a, a co collection of different ones. But we also have to think about domestic and trans-border. This is becoming more and more prevalent of an issue. What we mean by trans-border is what if I'm an Australian company and I put my data and my information on a cloud that's based in the US? The legal difficulty is that if you put any type of proprietary information on that cloud in the US, you have created vulnerabilities for that country. So more and more countries are passing laws and regulations around where you can put your stuff in the cloud. And Amazon is a really big provider in this space, but if it's not being hosted on servers that are in the same country, you can also get into uh, legal issues around that. So there is some concerns around whether the cloud is in our <laughs> cloud or in their cloud. So it's a, quite a confusing uh, area. But what is the promise of the cloud? Right? Lower cost. I mean, that's the number one thing. Most people start going after the cloud. They think we can lower our overall cost by putting our services up into the cloud. But it's also that immediate access to hardware. How many of you have ever put something up on Amazon? It can happen in minutes. You can have a server up and running. Obviously, it's a virtual server, but you can have that up and running in minutes. That's a very powerful thing than the way we traditionally do things where you order, you find the right specs for a server, you buy it, you configure it, you put it online. You know, that takes a considerable amount of time. This is immediate access to hardware and the ability to create, um, you know, more of your infrastructure. With very limited capital investment, right? We're not, uh, you know, investing in physical infrastructure. The lower IT barrier to innovation, being able to provide services in new ways that we can't or don't necessarily have the subject matter expertise to do today, that's another promise. Scalable services, and then of course, new applications or services that we don't have today. So when we start talking about a customer experience in the cloud, we have to realize that the customer has their cloud, right? The things that they do, the way that they interact with the products and services that they're using. So interactions with web, chat, email, e-commerce, social media, discussion forums, and again, this could be from laptops, from mobile phones. That's the customer cloud. So there's a lot of data that's going around in their little cloud that's meaningful to us, right, as far as understanding how well we're serving those customers. But it's a set of disconnected activities and services that are interacting online for that customer. And they're unique for every single customer, right? If I had everybody pull their phone out and we looked at what apps you had, everybody's going to have a very different experience of what they've got on their phone and the applications and stuff that you interact with online. Now, our customers want to do this because they have this, you know, the ability to secure data. They'll use cloud. You know, we have, how many of you use, like, um, what's the drive that you put up online? The popular oh, one. Google Drive? Or well, Google Drive is an example. Dropbox. Yeah, I don't use it. I've got Rackspace. So as soon as I got Rackspace in my mind, I forget about Dropbox. But that's one of the most popular ones. Customers are putting more and more of their photos and their life experiences online. It's cheap, and it's a way to get it from any device, which is another popular reason why. It's the information they need when they need it. Um, the cost for value is there. I mean, I pay pennies for storage on a monthly basis compared to what it would take for me to have a server to store that information to gain access from it. 
But there's also the quality of the service and the support. I can't remember the last time my Rackspace you know, cloud service went down. It's just, it's very reliable and it's cost effective. So more and more of our customers are now embracing in using cloud services. Now the service provider, we're doing the same thing, right? We're, we're using hosting services, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. We're using the cloud to either add to or replace our existing infrastructure. Why are we doing that? Because we want to be able to innovate the services we're providing, have higher levels of availability and reliability, more agility to meet the business needs, which generally means being able to scale up and scale down based on what the business is using. And, and I say this with caution. There's a perception that it's a better management of risk, but you have to understand what risk you have to know whether the service provider is doing a good job of managing it. Lower costs, faster time to market. So when we look at the customer experience in the cloud, it's all of these things, right? If we want to better manage a customer experience, we have to understand the dynamics of what our preferred customer cloud is, and then how that interacts with whatever cloud services that we provide and we're using. Now, we want to do this to innovate, but what does it do to our knowledge? Our knowledge is disparate across all these different systems. And if we're going to have a true understanding of what's going to create a better experience, we have to be able to pull data from very different systems, potentially different providers, to have an understanding of that total customer experience. So this is kind of what the picture looks like. We have our customer's preferred channel. It could be their cell phone, their laptop, whatever device that they're using to jump into the cloud. They're accessing their cloud, which then connects to whatever infrastructure we have that's out in the cloud and any online and infrastructure that we may have that's on-prem. And all of this together is the customer experience. So when we talk about managing a customer experience, imagine trying to come up with brand recognition across their crowd, cloud, into your cloud, and into your existing infrastructure. It makes it even more difficult to manage the experience and to create something that has brand recognition, that has that simple, clean interface that customers come to recognize. One of the things I think, you know, we see cloud computing and we think, wow, this is a really great thing. But in many cases, we have broken infrastructure. We have broken processes. We don't manage resources well. And then we go ahead and we put something into the cloud, it's still broken. The promise of the cloud doesn't fix problems. If anything, the more diverse the connection point, the bigger the problem is going to be. So when you talk about putting stuff into the cloud and leveraging the success of the cloud, we also have to think about how are we going to manage the processes. So when we look at something like this, how do we manage incident management from the customer's device through their cloud into our cloud and into our infrastructure, solving and restoring service for our customers. Problem management, how do we get the repetitive issues coming in from all the different data sources to understand what could potentially be a problem that we can identify and eliminate in order to improve the services. Change management, what happens when we're making changes in the infrastructure or changes are being made in the cloud that end up impacting our customers? How do we manage the, the notifications and the, the management of risk of change across the different clouds. So you can see why if it's not working well today and we put it into the cloud, it's likely to make a lot of these processes even worse and more difficult to manage. But more important to me is this information flow. How much knowledge are we not getting out from the customer cloud that's incredibly important to us to understand how can we better serve our customers? How can we create services that are more meaningful, that connect with our customers in the way that they want to connect? So the customer experience has to be managed across all of that. Now, one of the things that changes that is the, the, num the sheer number of touch points that our customers have. Right? I mean, I've just recently given in to having Twitter accounts, and I know, it's a shame. Um, but you think about just, just the traffic alone from this particular conference going through Twitter and being you know, populated out into a much larger uh, community. It's not just the people attending here, it's the people that have t attended in the past that you know, uh, are connected and follow the people that they've met here from before. 
That grows the community around HDI exponentially. Every single year we have attendees come, that connection. So how do we manage that flow of information? How can we leverage it to be more successful with our customers? But how do we manage that channel and use that to help populate how we can improve that customer experience? We have the company website, we have call center sales uh, departments, we have when we go out to our customers and we're submitting proposals to sell services, negotiations, we have delivery invoicing, technical support. There's a lot of different customer interaction points. Customer experience management is about making all of that seem like you're dealing with one single company. And having worked for a professional services organization for many years, I can tell you getting your sales staff to have the same message that your support staff do, same message getting into your request for a proposal, not to mention on the website, I mean, that was significant enough. And now we've blossomed this out into even more touch points with our customer, makes it even more difficult to have that uh, managed experience across that. Now, knowledge management, I think we know the value of knowledge management in most organizations, right? If we want to drive effective use of resources, human capital, financial capital, and, and to better focus in our customers, that means we have to have processes that are providing information that help us to understand how successful we are. It means we have to have the ability to understand that customer, capturing stuff within a CRM system that gives us visibility into how our customers are using our services, but then also how well is the organization and our infrastructure and our processes performing. So that performance, all of this is really our informational capital. It's what helps to drive what we can change that's delivering on the expectations to our customers. So knowledge is a very important part of the picture. So once we put all this stuff into the cloud, we then have disparate knowledge across multiple different systems and possibly across multiple different clouds. If you outsource completely, then they've got their cloud and your customers have got their cloud. It's, it could be a nightmare of different connections of information. Now, how do we measure performance across that? Think about measuring end-to-end -end customer performance when it starts on a cell phone and it ends in an internal IT department. How do you capture that information? How do you use it to improve that experience? Measuring end-to-end -end now is not as easy as it is if it's all internal to the organization. And again, because we have so many different vehicles of information coming in within the organization, we have to understand what knowledge is relevant based upon those touch points and those connection points and how can we leverage that knowledge to understand the customer experience. So it starts with understanding what's important to our customers. So if we know what their preferred method or channel is, we can focus our efforts on understanding and better filling the needs of our customers through that channel. This is a, a study that was produced by TSIA around what are the most requested resources from a self-service perspective from our customers. Number one is support policies online, right? Being able to go up, understand the general practices of what we do within support. The second one is online training. How many of you guys provide online training now? Okay, it's becoming more and more prevalent and a way to not only educate end users, but again, continue to market that message, whatever that message is that you're preferring to communicate out to your customers. And it's meeting the needs of our customers better. Because I don't know about you, but most technology is being made, it's much more simple to use today. I don't want to go and have to sit through an entire class. If I'm having troubles with just a certain feature of an application, I want to just go and get a snippet of information that will help me use that product and service better. So we see a lot more of YouTube being used for simple videos on how to use certain product functionality. It's a very effective way to get information out to our customers. But again, we have to manage the customer experience through that channel, especially if we get you know, a high amount of volume through there. Discussion forums are very good. Product docs, software downloads, file downloads, and knowledge base. Those are the top ones. All right, so let's look at some of the challenges. Um, this is, again, another survey. This one's done by IDC. But the challenges that companies have experienced when using cloud services, number one is security. 
And I have a couple slides coming up about security, but I think the important thing to remember is if we outsource it and we're having our outsourcer manage the security for us, it doesn't take away our responsibility. If we are going to get audited, we're the ones that are going to be held accountable for any risks and vulnerability. It doesn't matter if we put something into the cloud and we've got contracts in place and promises that that data will be secure. We are always going to be held accountable because we have to be accountable to our end consumers. The second thing is performance. The third is availability. And here, I think it's interesting it comes down to number four, but it's very difficult to integrate. And again, it comes, if you think about the customer experience, integrating that experience across the cloud and back into your internal IT infrastructure. Not enough ability to customize worry that on demand will eventually cost more and there's usually a lower po cost point of entry but you never know how the, those costs blossom as you scale up and the difficulty of bringing it back in house should it not be a successful endeavor for your organization regulatory requirements i talked a little bit about that that's becoming more and more prevalent about where that knowledge is stored there are other laws and regulations that apply to that um, and then not enough major suppliers. So an interesting order of that, but security being number one. So the challenge is, is the complexity of integration across multiple channels with your customers, the complexity and consistency of messaging, the same consistent message and brand across all those different uh, customer interaction points and managing that brand image. Security of the data that we're storing for our customers, but also you know, the security of the devices that they're using, and then governance. Those are probably the top challenges. Now, as far as risks are concerned, I found this quite interesting. Of course, I was doing a lot of research to look at uh, you know, what was considered to be the industry view of the risks around um, uh, putting your data in the cloud. But one of the things they, they point out is that if the value of, the, of your information, if it's really, really, really important to the organization, then the value of putting it into the cloud goes down significantly, meaning you need access to your knowledge when you need it. And if it's up in the cloud, we tend to get ourselves into some complex situations with the vendors, and access to that information isn't quite as straightforward as it used to be. So we have stingy data policies. Right? Yeah, it's in the cloud, yeah, it's yours, but how you access it and what information you can have, that is really based upon what you're putting into the cloud, but you have to be very careful that you are not put into a position where you can't get access to that data when you need it. It should still remain your data. And accessibility of the data, and this is driven a lot because of the, the requirements to have secure environments. But once they start, imagine if you put all these companies in the cloud and then you start providing different ways of those customers to access that data, what have you done? You've opened up a lot of more points of entry into your organization to manage from a security perspective. So it makes sense for the cloud providers to resist how many different ways in which they provide that data to their customers. It helps them to keep the, the strength of their security. So they actually have policies in place where you're not able to access the data. Disconnected experiences, I talked about that because we have such diverse systems and where that data is held. Um, but we, have, we rely on the supplier also to have the appropriate controls in place in order to keep that data protected. They have suppliers that they work with. They have customers that they work with. There's a whole lot of other interfaces going on across a common infrastructure where your information is being stored. And then, again, going back to the governance side of this, where whenever you're putting data or information into the cloud, we also have to be careful to make sure that we're not breaking any laws or regulations that apply to that data. So the, the security concerns around confidentiality, this means that only the authorized parties or systems should have access to the data that's in the cloud. So the cloud has an increased number of parties and systems. Just the fact that we have more of them makes it difficult to manage confidentiality. Then we look at privacy, which is the disclosure of personal data. And we've had so many public disclosures of, of information lately between Target and Home Depot, any other ones that I... Sony Pictures. Pardon me? Sony Pictures. Sony Pictures. Anthem. 
Oh, yeah, that one just happened, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, I'm not on Blue Cross, but yeah, my son is. So when we start talking about privacy of information, think about how many more connections that they have and the potential for um, accidental disclosure. The more connections, the more the potential. So again, putting something into the cloud, we're hoping that our cloud providers can manage that level of complexity. It's a lot easier to do as they're growing their business, but as the business becomes massive, we have more connections, more potential uh, for accidental disclosure. Integrity means that it can only be changed by authorized parties. Again, more connections could lead to more entry for hackers. Availability, heavy requirement for infrastructure and availability at all times. And you know, we expect this. I mean, Amazon, we're expecting availability all the time. I mean, that's the kind of, kind of the expectation. And then the authentication part of this, we've had a lot of that where you get emails, you know, phishing emails and try to get capture your account information to gain access to your account. There's a lot of different ways in which we can impact that authentication. We want to make sure that we're granting trust across transactions and applications that are meeting together in that cloud and that those interactions are authenticated. So our governance model, now we've got these laws and regulations that tell us what we can and cannot do. We have the risk to the customer's data that these are typically applied to, right? Like HIPAA for healthcare information and PCI compliance for credit card information. That, the, the, these are really around protecting the end consumer. And of course, now we have them coming in through multiple. I mean, how many of you use Kaiser or, or a healthcare provider that now provides access to your information online? I mean, think of how many more entry points this is for them to be able to manage that security. So we have the provider helping to manage that risk, but we also have whatever we have internally still in our infrastructure, we have to be managing that risk. That's what creates compliance. So the risk management, which is still owned internally, we can outsource it, but when we get in trouble, it's us that gets in trouble, not them. I mean, we can hold them accountable and put penalties and fines and everything else in place, but the public image is, we screwed up, your data is exposed, that's our risk. So we have to manage the risk across those different clouds and different transaction points. So compliance has to be moved into the cloud, accountability still remains with the enterprise, and only the risk can be managed externally on behalf. So we can outsource it and hope that they have everything in place that we need, we can put contracts in place, um, and, and you know, hopefully we've got things managed. So some critical success factors to think about. Anytime you start putting stuff into the, into the cloud, you need to be thinking about the customer. Customer experience management is really about making sure that you are an advocate for the customer, that you are um, leveraging your organization across the board, across all those touch points and interaction points and creating a consistent, branded interaction with your customer. Something that doesn't just you know, say, oh, we're happy with your company, but something that delights them. So when we start putting stuff into the cloud, being able to create that consistent wow factor across all those different channels is very difficult to do. So we have to be thinking about that prior to putting stuff into the cloud. And on a side note to that, our customers are already in the cloud. We can't control whether they go into the cloud or not, but we can control the way that we develop the applications and services that they use while they're in the cloud working with our company. And we want to make sure that as we're doing this, that we can cons uh, consistently still provide outstanding service. Um, you know, how do, how, how do you guys manage complaints if they come in through, through Twitter? Right? Do you have the ability to... to respond to that. Now, I'm going to give you a great example because this is something that happened to me recently. I have all my stuff um, for my websites on one and one They're a hosting provider. I have a managed server. I don't have to do anything with it. They manage it. All I do is monkey around with the, the open source products that I've put up there. And the whole thing went down. And I had a student call me and say, I can't get on to the online campus, Julie. The, the just There's a blank page. I'm like, oh, crap. I haven't been up there in a while. I haven't I didn't even know if it's up and running, it's just always working. So I go to the website, it disappeared. So I call one and one, right? I get on the phone, it's immediately the first thing I do, I call, and I get a, I hear muffled, somebody answers, and then I hear this muffled, 
It sounds like somebody's literally got their hand over the phone. And they're going, what are, what, what's going on? Because it's probably got chaos going, right? Guy hangs up on me. I'm like, what? I call back immediately. I get click. Then I call back, and it's busy. I'm thinking, okay, well, at least you're smart. Now you took the phones off the hook, right? <laughs> so what did I do? So now I have a Twitter account, right? First thing I do is I put up there customer experience management, really one-on-one, -on -one, hanging on your customers. I could not believe what happened afterwards. I had a bunch of other hosting companies all saying, come over to us. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite an experience. But you know what? The only way that I knew there was an outage was one and one had put something off on their Twitter account. But they had never told me before then that that was going to be their preferred uh, method. And they were having a denial of service, which, I, you know, I'm an IT person. I can understand that. But you don't hang up on me. You give me information that allows me to call that student back and say, you know, give me about 15 minutes. I think the system will be back up and running. But I'm like, I just respond, I don't know, I'll let you know. That really did not sit well with me, so I've been looking for a new hosting company. Um, but that's the kind of thing, how do you manage that? You know, you can hear stories all the time of people calling up and giving away something and saying, we're really sorry that that happened. But we have to have the ability to manage that knowledge that's going on out there in Cyberville with our customers and respond to that as well. So we want a consistent, outstanding <coughs> customer experience across all those channels. That means brand is a relationship. Companies that create relationships with their customers. Do you understand what the word relationship means? Who's related to us? Family, right? What is it about family that makes us feel good about ourselves? They know us, right? What else? They're there, they're consistent in our lives, they support us on what we need to do. Relationship building is very difficult between a company and a customer. I have one service provider that I use all, all the time, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other addicts in the room, but Starbucks, right? No matter where I go in the world, if I go to a Starbucks, I have a very consistent experience. But when I go to the Starbucks in my hometown, I walk through the door, they got my cup, it's already written on, and it's right there, they, they know who I am. That's a relationship. They build brand loyalty by giving you stars whenever you buy coffee, and then every 12th star, you get a free cup of coffee. They've made it possible for you to buy your coffee with your phone. They're leveraging the customer cloud in the way that the customers love, and the brand image that they have when you go through the, into the physical store is also managed to make it feel like you have a relationship with the company. That's what creates a consistent, somebody keep coming back again and again and again because it's that feeling like I'm part of the family. It's about emotional response. Up until the last iPod or phone that I bought from Apple, I was very dissatisfied with the packaging. But up until the last one I bought, every single time I bought an uh, uh, Apple product, the packaging alone amazed me. Just opening that, I was like, okay, how do they have this whole thing packed in here? You know, and you pull the plastic top off and they got everything interwoven in there. That's not unintended. That's an intentional designed masterpiece. They spent a tremendous amount of time. Now it's cardboard. It wasn't quite the same, but you know, I understand cost is as it is. But it does, it elicits an emotional response. How many of you use Google and how many of you use Bing? Why, why do you use Google? Simple, and what is not on the front page that's on all the other search engines? Do you remember AOL when it had just, I haven't used AOL since, I don't know, the 60s I guess, but I mean, <laughs> it has all this crap all over. My stepfather still uses it. Whenever I go home, he's going, I lost all my contacts again, where are they? And you're looking at the screen and going, I don't know, where are they, right? I mean, it's, a, it's just this atrocity of over-communication of information. The reason why we use Google is because it's simple, it's clean. That's an intended brand for them. Everything about what they do was meant to say, we want to make searching as easy as it possibly can be for our customers. It's just a box, put whatever you want. If you've ever been to Google, they have a, a projector in their lobby, and they're broadcasting down the side of the, the wall all the things that people search in. 
very interesting to watch what people <laughs> type in their search engines. I think it's cleaned up because I didn't see anything, you know, not appropriate. But they make it easy. They make everything easy. You use their email. I just recently was uh, changed over to Office 365 online. Oh my God, if Office could do online like Google, it would have been amazing. But it's just like Microsoft product on a PC. They're not intuitive. They're getting a heck of a lot better, but when you start trying to point and click and try to find your way around, it just feels more difficult than it does if I'm using Gmail. Just a clean, simple interface. That's a branded experience. It's in everything that they do. It's about emotion, feeling, thought, brand experience elicits an emotional response from people. They feel good about interacting with your company. So to do that requires us to create integration across all of those touch points to create that emotional response, whether I'm using my phone to buy coffee, whether I'm going into the store, I get a consistent branded experience. So as far as customer support in the cloud, all I can say is I think this is a tremendous value add to internal support organizations, external support organizations. The cloud has a way of helping you to provide services that you can't today, to innovate the way that you're providing services. But one of the things I encourage you is to make sure you understand exactly the online journey that you want to create for your end user before you go putting stuff into the cloud. Because you want to make sure that it does have that seamless feel to it, that it doesn't create more hurdles for your customer than it does value that you're hoping to contribute. It requires a lot of careful planning and strategy, knowing and understanding what your options are, hosting as a service, software as a service, platform or enterprise or IT, whatever you're going to put up in the cloud. We have to be careful not to put so much as a service in there that we're not understanding how to manage that complete experience across their cloud and into our cloud. This requires us to co-create that experience. You need to go talk to your end users to find out what makes the most sense in their business processes, right? Your unique customer base. If you're ser serving external customers, it's a little bit more difficult, but if you're serving internal customers, you should be asking them, how can we make this easier? What's the easiest point of entry? How can we make it better for you? It co-create that experience. They need to be part of understanding it because they're the only ones that know what's going to work for them. We need to understand their needs and to provide a cloud that works. Part of the reason why we're having problems with shadow IT is because we're not changing fast enough for our end users. Technology, the price has gone down so much that our customers can buy so much more power in a cell phone. So they're going out, they're buying their own computers, they're doing their own thing, they're putting apps on their phone. Why? because we're not making this accessible to them in a way that makes their job easier. And we need to begin thinking about what it is that works for them and put together a support experience across this using the cloud wherever possible to innovate, but do so in a way that it helps them uh, do their jobs better. We have a much higher potential for adaptability with the cloud. Scaling up, scaling down, doing what we can to manage that volume, the promise is there for the support organization. We just have to make sure we do it in, a deep, in the right way. So we need a detailed strategy of how to understand putting our, cloud, our, our customers into the cloud, what we provide to them, and how we especially manage their data, because that's what, how we can more effectively manage their experience. All right, so the cloud provides us with a lot of promises and benefits. Um, and I can tell you, you know, if we don't start developing strategies around this now, our customers, I mean, we're going to become even more and more and more irrelevant internally in IT. So we need to be thinking about the best way to leverage it, but at the same time, thinking about the overall customer experience so that we can continue to manage it. We build really awesome service desks, and we're providing incredible service internally, but we need to adapt and begin bringing in interface and touch points to our customers that enable them to work with us much more efficiently within their business processes. Questions? Yes. 
started working uh, from home, and which was a, a different experience for me, going from a place with IT, everything was there, and, and like you said, much like your experience, everything now that we do, we're accessing all of these uh, these companies that have things in the cloud are they, they do backups better they have everything so how, I mean how did you get started with that experience um, interesting you know when I started uh, as a director of an outsourcing uh, support organization this was back in late 1990s we were actually had uh, analysts in the home that were helping us with overflow, but they were also subject matter experts that had skill sets that we couldn't recruit for. Um, and we paid them on a per call basis to take these really tough calls that we had. And this was very early on in the days of putting people into the remote locations. But the number one thing that made that successful wasn't the technology. It was having a process that efficiently got a hold of those individuals and worked them into that flow with the customer so that it seemed like to the customer that it was all one big happy family and that it was just one experience. So we had to figure out ways because they weren't always there and they weren't always available and the technology wasn't there for them to sign in directly to the uh, telephony system so that they would show up as an available analyst. We had to have good scheduling, good handoffs between the remote agents. Process really helped us to embed that into our support organization effectively. So I haven't worked in a physical office since 1999, and I'm fairly productive myself, and I've worked for companies. And it all gets down to me, the number one thing that I always try to fix immediately is communication. You would be surprised on how often companies that put people in the homes so irregularly communicate. You need weekly phone calls just to touch base. Doesn't mean you're you know, talking and, and discussing strategy on a weekly basis, but if you don't know what projects people are working on and you don't know what tasks they're working on, you can't manage that. And so you're gonna have weaknesses in your customer experience because things are gonna drop down. You don't wanna be left you know, not knowing uh, what's going on and, and where things are uh, in that workflow. Any other questions? Uh, I'm working for a hosting company in Iceland, and uh, we're very much moving into the cloud. And one of the main obstacles that we're having right now is, is actually delivering the services you know, to, up to the standards that people are used to when they go directly, for instance, to Microsoft or, or Amazon or something. Do you have any specific advice or things that we need to focus on the most or first? Because, I mean, the, uh, the task is this big, and uh, we need to do something fast. And uh, it's, it's also a matter of prioritizing what we need to do. You just partially answered the question for me. Um, I think that, first of all, when you're going into a market space right now that's already proliferated with a lot of vendors that know what they're doing, the first thing that you're challenged with is brand recognition. Right? You're, you have to find your competitive edge and what it is that you're going to be providing and how you'll compete with the other players in the market space. Now, you may develop specific channels or ways to interact with your customers that aren't available you know, to, to, in the other providers. You can also put yourself in the position where we know our customers. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yeah, you can put it into that cloud, but that's like a Nimbus. Over here, we got our own little community. You know what I mean? You can personalize it in a way that you're differentiating that service. But when it comes back to the delivery side of it and creating consistency, I think you have to pick just a few of your most important channels and focus on how you will manage that channel. Because it's not just making sure the technology is up and running. It's having the processes in place to manage events, to manage incidents, to manage your customer interface when things, when they, not just from a sales perspective, bringing the money in the door, which is what you generally focus on when you're brand new in the market, you want revenue, revenue, revenue. But boy, when you start growing, how are we going to deliver that service? So you need to also focus on the key interfaces of the delivery of that. So incident management is going to be extremely important. What do we do when things go down and we need to respond? That's got to be one of your major focal points at the very beginning. And that customer touch point and how you're going to manage that. Are you going to provide a portal? Like one in one You don't hang up on your customer, but you make sure they know what's your preferred method while you're chasing fires Look, we'll tweet it out. This is where you'll get the information. But you know, expect us to be managing the problem for you. We may not be as, but you have to have you know formalized those lines of communication. 
I would say problem management is also very critical because that will help to ensure that the quality of the service will improve over time so you have fewer things that you have to respond to from your customers. And of course, event management is, is pretty, pretty important. I throw change in there too. Um, but yeah, focus on just your priority channel point, firm it up as much as you can, and then come up with your differentiated way that you're going to compete with the others in the market space. Very good question there. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you guys all for attending, and enjoy the rest of the conference.